All right, welcome everybody to our March 2022 GDJC talk. We're delighted to welcome Dr. Anthony Muchai Monyara, who just finished his PhD. He um, completed that at the University of Glasgow and was investigating the risk, uh, the etiology and perceptions of diabetes risk um, in Black populations and more specifically in Kenya. So his talk will summarize one of the studies from his PhD, which was conducted in Nairobi, Kenya, and his title of his talk is Comparison of Risk Factors Between People with Type 2 Diabetes and Matched Controls in Nairobi, Kenya. And as you can see, this is um, a highlight of a paper that he's published from his PhD. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Anthony. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, thank you so much for this platform to present part of my work. So I'll just go straight into it. So um, this is a world map that some of us may have seen developed by the International uh, Diabetes Federation to show the predicted increases in diabetes prevalence by the year 2045. And the story here is that diabetes is predicted to increase globally but some regions will have a higher increase than others. So uh, this region here is Sub-Saharan Africa and it's expected to have an increase of 134%. So the people who are living with diabetes, um, I think will be more than 45 million um, in 2045 compared to about 14 million in 2021. So Kenya is one of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's in East Africa. It is governed by a central government and 47 semi-autonomous um, county governments. It has a population of 48 million, and this is according to the 2019 national census. And the population is mainly youthful. So the elderly or uh, people who are over the age of 60 account for only 6% of the population. So the burden of diabetes in um, Kenya, um, they are, according to the National um, Step Survey, the WHO Step Service uh, conducted sometime in 2015, the age adjusted prevalence of diabetes is 2.4%. That is the national um, age adjusted prevalence, but the prevalence is higher in urban settings compared to rural settings. So almost two times higher in urban settings than rural settings. Nairobi is one of the largest urban settings um, and one of the largest cities in East Africa, which is home to over 4 million people. And the diabetes prevalence is even higher there. So two population-based studies, and these were large population-based studies, over 2,000, a sample of over 2,000 in low-income settings, what are known as informal settlements or slums. Um, the, prevalence of diabetes was about 5%. So one in every 20 people had diabetes in 2013. And so the prevalence could be higher now. Um, and recent modeling estimates from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation show that diabetes uh, was one of the top causes of mortality in Nairobi in 2019. And, and there has been an very large increase in diabetes related mortality between 2009 and 2019. So diabetes is here and it had an increase of 65.3% moving from um, rank 13 to rank nine. So um, there has been a very large increase in the burden of uh, diabetes, which um, requires a prevention. So uh, the Kenya um, Diabetes Prevention and Control documents, uh, various uh, policy documents have acknowledged that uh, the prevalence of diabetes is uh, rising, such, uh, for example, the Kenya um, Strategy for Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases mentions that diabetes is escalating and there is an urgent need for prevention. However, a policy analysis of these documents uh, found that while they are well aligned to international recommendations, they are based on scant local evidence. And so there is need for more local evidence um, if we are to develop effective preventive interventions 
that are contextually specific to Kenya. Now, there are a few um, Kenyan studies that have been conducted and they have reported associations between diabetes and um, obesity, age, hypertension, physical inactivity, alcohol intake, tobacco use, family history, um, hand grip strength and childhood starvation. But as you can see, there are not many um, of these studies that have been conducted. I have not done a systematic review, uh, but I think still we will not find many more studies that have been conducted looking at the associations of the risk factors of uh, diabetes. And for this talk, I'm mainly concentrating on type 2 diabetes, which is the main type of uh, diabetes. That's why I'm talking about prevention and uh, risk factors. Um, so we conducted this study to understand um, the risk factors of type 2 diabetes in Nairobi. Um, and specifically the main or the traditional risk factors um, such as obesity, diet and physical activity, but also emerging risk factors such as muscle mass and strength, height and early life exposures. Because there is um, debate that um, these emerging risk factors may be more important than the traditional risk factors based on evidence uh, that show that uh, black populations develop diabetes at low um, obesity levels, for example. So maybe other risk factors may be explaining more, um, may be explaining more risk than um, the traditional, the main uh, risk factors that are known in high income uh, settings. So we conducted a um, case control study Initially, we wanted to recruit a higher sample, but because of COVID, we had to stop recruitment um, of participants um, in March 2020 when the first case of uh, COVID was reported in Kenya. So we ended up with uh, 70 type 2 diabetes cases, um, that is people with diabetes, and that, that those were divided or they were disaggregated as 37 women and 33 men and um, 70, we matched them to 70 controls so people who did not have diabetes. And we matched on age, sex, and socioeconomic status. So this uh, sample had an 80% power to detect associations between the exposures, uh, which have a prevalence of at least 30% in the general population, uh, with, and uh, type two diabetes with an odds ratio of at least 2.7 at a significance level of 0.05. We included people who had lived in Nairobi for at least five years, who were aged between 35 and 64 years, who had no health condition, um, no self-reported health condition that would influence cardiometabolic health, and who were recent for the cases we wanted recent um, cases, so people who had been diagnosed with diabetes for the last two years. We used uh, self-reported uh, measures, so we had a questionnaire, um, researcher administered questionnaire, and we also did some measurements and we analyzed our data for associations, uh, mainly using logistic uh, regression models and adjusted for covariates. So for measurements, uh, we used the uh, tape measure to measure the waist and hip circumference. We had the Tanita by impedance scale, which uh, measured the weight, calculated the BMI, and also measured uh, fat-free mass, which is a proxy of skeletal muscle mass, and uh, also percentage body fat and fat mass. We had, uh, or we used a dynamometer, which uh, we used to measure hand grip strength, um, and grip strength is a proxy of uh, muscle strength. We issued accelerometers to participants to wear for seven consecutive days, and this was uh, to measure their physical activity and their sedentary behavior. We used, um, we, we measured blood pressure, and also we measured uh, sugar levels, just to make sure that the controls do not have undiagnosed uh, diabetes. So um, our controls, so uh, this uh, 
column will be controls and cases and then disaggregated by sex. Um, the age was about 50 years. Um, the controls may have been slightly younger than the cases, but that was not significant. Um, residence in Nairobi was over 20 years. Um, most of uh, the participants had primary level education. And uh, for the wealth index, um, they were distributed almost. Um, so the second and the third wealth index is where most of the people are. And the, but there are no differences between uh, in these measures between the cases and the controls. Uh, and then for the time of since diagnosis, it was about uh, 15 months for women cases and 13 months for male cases. So as I mentioned, we used a logistic uh, regression model to calculate or determine the associations between diabetes and the risk factors. Uh, the first model was not adjusted. Um, the second model was adjusted for social demographic um, characteristics, so age, sex, education, and wealth index. And the third model was adjusted for social demographic um, characteristics and other covariates. So, for example, height would have been adjusted here for a deposit, um, alcohol intake, physical activity, you know, other uh, covariates. So, we found the cases to be shorter and there was an association. Um, and also, something else I've, I've not mentioned is that. Um, all continuous variables were standardized in the models to determine the effect of one standard deviation increase on the odds of um, type 2 diabetes. So the odds you're seeing here are based on per increase in SD of the continuous variable. So per, in, uh, per SD increase in height, um, every SD increase in height was associated with lower odds of diabetes in all the three uh, models. There was no association uh, between type 2 diabetes and weight and percentage body fat and fat mass, fat free mass. Uh, in fat free mass, in the first model, there was no association, but after adjustment, um, increases in fat free mass uh, was associated with lower odds of uh, type 2 diabetes. BMI, um, no associations. Uh, and in act actually, the women uh, controls had the higher slightly higher BMI, so the, the mean BMI here was uh, obese, so 31.3, and in cases it was 29.6. And then for men, it was normal weight in both uh, controls and cases. For waist circumference, also we didn't find associations, uh, but for women, um, in the women controls, uh, the waist circumference was 95, almost similar to actually higher, slightly higher, uh, to cases 93.4, but they compensated, the controls compensated uh, for that with the, uh, with the hip circumference, which is this. Uh, so they had a higher hip circumference by five centimeters. Then for the men, um, the controls had, uh, had a lower uh, waist circumference, so by seven centimeters. And so when we calculated the waist, to hip ratio, which is uh, this measure here. There was an association uh, uh, per SD increase. Um, it was associated with two times higher in uh, odds of uh, diabetes. Then hand grip strength um, was lower in cases. And per SD increase, um, it was associated with lower odds of uh, type 2 diabetes. And then for sleep duration, the self-reported sleep duration, uh, it was seven hours in both cases and controls, and there were no associations. So um, this is other data on uh, childhood starvation. So we asked that question whether, and this is self-reported, whether people experienced uh, childhood starvation, and they would say yes or no. And this was not associated uh, with diabetes. Uh, being hypertensive, uh, self-reported. So having been diagnosed with uh, hypertension was associated with uh, type 2 diabetes in the first two models. But these um, associations uh, were not significant in the third model. 
then family history of diabetes. Um, first, having a first degree relative with type two diabetes was associated with three times higher um, odds of diabetes. Smoking uh, status and alcohol intake status, we are not uh, associated with type two diabetes in our data. So this is um, some of the data on diet. In general, we found that the cases had better dietary uh, practices compared to the controls. They had uh, changed, probably they had changed their diet. And we asked the question whether they had been advised by a health worker to change their diets. And the majority of uh, cases, so 95% of women, 85% of men had been advised to change their diet by um, a health worker. And so you find that they were taking less um, sugar. Uh, so for example, the frequency, self-reported frequency of adding sugar to beverages and uh, frequency of intake of processed foods high in sugar, uh, they were taking less of that. And they were taking more fruits and vegetables. Although uh, the mean servings per day was three, uh, three and a half servings, which is below the recommended five servings. So this is uh, physical activity, and this has um, both accelerometer measured physical activity and self-reported. So this section is accelerometry, and this is self-reported. So in accelerometry, we found that physical activity levels, um, we are not associated with uh, type 2 diabetes, and physical activity levels were high in both uh, controls and cases. Um, moderate and vigorous physical activity was 40, about 45 minutes in women and over 70 minutes in men, with women accumulating about 7,000 steps per day and men over 10,000 steps per day. For self-reported physical activity, most of the physical activity came from work-related and travel-related with very few uh, minutes being accumulated in um, Leisure uh, related physical activity. And actually, in, uh, in one of the models here, the cases had more uh, leisure related MV, uh, moderate and vigorous physical activity compared to uh, controls. But this was not significant in this other model. So, what are the implications of these findings? So first is that there is utility of family history, um, uh, specifically first degree relative, to identify those at increased risk of uh, diabetes. Second is that um, our cases did not were not more obese, um, so they didn't have a higher percentage or more fat than the controls, but they distributed their fat differently. So they di distributed their fat centrally. And this finding has been supported by other studies in Sub-Saharan Africa that have reported that central obesity measures are better predictors of diabetes than general obesity, and general obesity here to mean uh, BMI. So that means that general messages uh, to lose weight may be less appropriate for this population, and there may be a need to switch focus from BMI to central obesity to identify those at an increased risk of um, type 2 diabetes. And also there may be need to intervene to reduce weight in those with high central obesity, even if they are normal weight. So for example, our men, their, uh, the average BMI was normal weight, but they were more uh, centrally obese uh, for the cases than the controls. Then for the height and hand grip that were uh, an increase in, um, in each where was associated with lower odds of diabetes, could it be an indicator of early life environment because um, height is determined by genes, um, but also by the growth phases, prenatal infancy and childhood and puberty, and growth in one phase determines the growth or the height achieved in the next phase and determines the overall uh, adult height. And also hand, hand grip strength is determined by hereditary body height, but also by 
early life environment factors such as maternal and placental factors, exercise and nutrition during development, but also you can increase uh, your hand grip strength or your muscle strength by um, exercising as an adult. So these indicators um, or um, hand, uh, height and hand grip strength could be measures or could be proxy indicators of an adverse early life environment. But uh, meta-analysis have found that an increase in um, grip strength, even minimal increases, uh, produce clinically significant reductions in risk, which support our findings. So one is the increase in grip strength uh, reduces the risk by 19%. That is um, a meta-analysis um, finding. And so interventions to increase um, grip strength or muscle strength, such as through resistance training, may be appropriate for diabetes prevention. And this could be achieved by um, emphasizing the muscle strengthening um, activities or exercises as highlighted in the WHO physical activity guidelines. So for diet, um, we found the cases to have improved dietary practices. Um, it could be that uh, this was due to um, an intervention due, due to a health worker advising the cases to change their diet, although um, the practices were not optimal. So about what of the cases achieved the five uh, daily recommended fruit and veg servings. So it means we could improve, uh, there's an opportunity to improve diet uh, through health education, but also there's need to address the barriers that could be there, um, that could be, um, that could be uh, preventing people from optimally, or um, from optimizing their healthy dietary practices. Also our findings, we were not able to measure the extent of change, but, uh, so we didn't have data before. The, the diet, uh, the dietary practices before people were diagnosed with diabetes and what they were um, taking now. And also our um, findings could be due to a social desirability bias. So people could be saying what was expected of them rather than what they were actually doing. So uh, the, on the limitations is that we First is that uh, the study adds to the scant uh, evidence available on diabetes etiology and risk factors. Um, the limitations is that we used a pragmatic convenience sample, which limits generalizability. We had one measure, um, a single measurement, uh, which means it limited temporality of associations. Um, there is, we cannot make also inferences from our findings. There is a possibility of reverse causality in the diabetes muscle mass uh, stroke um, strand association. Um, but our findings highlight that uh, diabetes is associated with uh, family history, uh, specifically a first degree relative with diabetes, a higher central obesity, a shorter height and a lower grip strength and also um, a lower muscle mass and uh, muscle strength. So there's utility of family history um, and central obesity in identifying people at an increased risk of diabetes. And there's need for more evidence uh, to identify or to, to determine if low height and muscle strength play a causal role or are indicators of an adverse early life environment. And also more evidence to understand how to better prevent uh, diabetes in these uh, settings. So I would want to thank the study participants, the community mobilizers who helped to in the recruitment, my research assistants, the uh, diabetes support groups who helped again with recruitment, and the Gaira Health Center where I collected most of this data. And thank you all for listening.